Buenos días. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, today to this webinar. This webinar is now taking place within the World Salt Awareness Week. And this year, the World Salt Awareness Week has the slogan, more flavor, less salt. And the Pan American Health Organization would like to join in this global campaign so that we can join efforts with the international community and thus be able to share the progress attained by the region. Today, we'd like to share with you some of the novelties and the progress attained in the region in connection with the implementation of our policies in order to improve food environments and thus uh, to be able to reduce uh, salt consumption that still continues to be very high in the region. As many of you might know, excessive salt consumption is uh, the main uh, cause of hypertension, which is uh, the main uh, risk uh, factor for cardio and uh, cerebrovascular diseases as well as the uh, causes of other non-communicable diseases. Thus, uh, the promotion of effective uh, public policies, such as uh, the reformulation of processed uh, and ultra-processed meats, uh, front uh, labeling, as well as the elimination uh, of uh, food with high salt uh, levels, raising awareness uh, campaigns, as well as surveillance in order to determine consumption as the main sources of the sodium, which are strategies recommended by the World Health Organization in order to attain the goal of reducing in 30% salt consumption in the global population by 2025. We'd like to share with you a tool at this webinar, a tool that we're launching in order to clearly and easily identify the progress attained by each one of the countries in connection with this agenda. Besides, I would like to share with you studies and research on sodium content in artisanal products and products that are sold on the street and at the implementation of social marketing strategies. We hope that you will enjoy this event and thank you once again for being with us. Then with these uh, words, I'd like to apologize on behalf of Rosa Sandoval, the interim head of the unit, uh, since uh, she could not be with us this morning because uh, of an urgent uh, matter. But in any case, uh, on behalf of the unit and on behalf of Pajo, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. And we will begin with a, a video, as you know very well during these uh, times of the pandemic of COVID-19, many people are spending more time at home. And so they've had uh, an opportunity of uh, trying out new recipes. And that is why we want uh, more flavor, less salt, because uh, there are many recipes uh, and many food uh, that we can cook at home with much less salt or even without salt. So we have a recipe of a tomato sauce without salt. So we will show you the video now. And at the end of the webinar, we will also show it again in English. So currently we'll watch it in Spanish. So please go ahead with the video. Let us prepare a healthy tomato sauce with more flavor, less salt. With this, we reduce the consumption of salt because an excessive consumption of it leads to hypertension and no cardiovascular diseases. These are really good ingredients, easy to get. Five large tomatoes, two chopped onions, two garlic cloves, one and a half teaspoon of paprika. Then we have pepper, cinnamon in powder, half a lemon, and we have basil. 
you have to wash your hands every time you go to the kitchen to prepare food. Now place the tomatoes in a pot with water until it starts boiling, and then you can peel the tomatoes carefully, and we add them to the blender together with the onion, the pepper, the paprika, and the cinnamon that offers a good contrast and adds to the flavors. You now have to save the mixture, and then you cook that mixture for 15 to 20 minutes until it boils, and then you add the bay leaf. And then we remove the bay leaf, and then we add half a tomato, and then you serve the the tomato sauce. You can place it in a glass container and let it just uh, stay there for 20 to 30 minutes before you put it in the, the freezer. And you can keep it there uh, for up to a week or you can freeze it and use it later. You can use it as a base for pastas. You can also use it for rice, for lentils, for beans or any other dish that you prefer. Muchas, uh, gracias por este Thank video. you very much uh, for this uh, video. As you can see, there are several options uh, in order to produce and to cook uh, with uh, less uh, salt or even without salt. Uh, so when cooking, we ourselves have better control over the content of uh, salt uh, in our foodstuffs. One of the important sources is the salt that you add uh, when you cook uh, or when you bring it to the table, a table salt. And it turns out that uh, you can use uh, herbs and uh, other uh, los species and seasonings in order to give uh, food uh, a better taste. Something else is uh, the food that we eat uh, out on the street or in restaurants, uh, and also to a larger extent, uh, processed uh, food and processed uh, meats uh, contain high levels of salt. Uh, so there are other sources of salt consumption. I want you to know that we have simultaneous interpretation of this uh, webinar. And so if you go to the bottom of the screen, there is a globe that says interpretation where you can select uh, the language of your choice. So you can uh, select uh, if you want to listen to this webinar in Spanish or in English. We have a very interesting panel and the first speaker will be Nadia Flexner. And uh, Nadia is uh, a consultant uh, with PAHO and she has uh, worked uh, in mapping and she's going to introduce us now. And uh, on top of that, uh, she is undergoing in a PhD at the University in Toronto in Canada, where she's uh, obtaining her PhD in nutrition. So she will show us that this mapping, this new tool that we're launching today, the document is in English, but uh, we've also prepared a brief uh, summary in English and Spanish, as well as uh, Portuguese, and soon they will be available on the campaign's um, webpage. So without further ado, let me give the floor to Nadia, and uh, you can ask uh, your questions uh, after the presentations. You can start uh, including your questions in the Q&A section. And now let us give the floor to Nadia. Nadia, please. Thank you very much, Leo, for that kind introduction and to Pajo for the possibility of presenting today. I will show you some results of the research that we did on the initiatives in order to reduce salt and sodium consumption in the Americas. The final report, as Leo said, is ready to be published and will be available on the Pajo website. This is only a preview of what we have as part of the nine voluntary actions for the global action plan for the prevention and control of NCDs, we have the relative reduction of the average intake of salt. It recommends to reduce salt consumption to less than five grams, that is approximately one teaspoon a day in adults. 
reducing salt consumption has been identified as one of the most uh, cost-efficient measures that countries can adopt in order to improve the health of the population. As I mentioned, most uh, people consume as an average of nine to 12 grams of salt a day, which is twice uh, as much uh, of uh, the limit uh, of the daily intake recommended by WHO of five grams. These are the most cost-effective uh, measures in order to promote healthy nutrition, particularly to reduce salt consumption, to reformulate the food uh, stuff so that they will contain less salt by setting uh, target goals in salt content in food the creation of an enabling environment in public institution campaigns in the mass media that will lead to a change in behavior and the establishment of uh, labeling, front labeling in packages. We also show these uh, parameters and monitor the same. This is also in line with the recommendations of the technical package of uh, SHAKE of uh, WHO. And um, we move on to the review. The review had uh, four main objectives. Uh, the first one was to have an inventory of uh, policies and national initiatives that deal with the reduction of sodium and salt in the food of the population. Second, detect uh, gaps uh, on policies in the region following the most co cost-effective recommendations that I just mentioned from WHO. And the uh, third, to make available a repository of policies or laws and regulations in order to reduce sodium consumption. And finally, to discuss uh, priorities uh, and possibilities for future work in the region. We used uh, a mixed methodological study in order to analyze uh, the data for 34 countries. The data were collected through a structured review of national sources, and most of them, in order to find uh, policies and current initiatives in order to reduce sodium intake. Then first, uh, we consider the responses uh, to the survey online on national initiatives in order to reduce uh, salt and sodium consumption that was done by PAHO in 2016. Then uh, we reviewed uh, the databases of the survey on the ability of countries in order to phase NCDs and on risk factors that was done uh, regularly by PAHO. And in here, in this case, we reviewed uh, those uh, for 2017 and 2019. We also reviewed uh, the repositories of uh, legislation collected by the Regula Initiative in PAHO 2018, and we searched uh, the official websites for the Ministries of Health, Education, and Agriculture. We also checked uh, the National Congress in each country and official newsletters and bulletins of government when they were made available. This uh, search uh, was done between January 2018 and April 2019. And last but not least, uh, we also searched uh, in Google Scholar and Google. And um, then we developed uh, country profiles with the information collected that was sent uh, to the public health agency in each country for their validation and comments. The structured uh, review took into account the following, then the inclusion or not an, of an objective or recommendation for more general policies, such as national development policies for public health, control and prevention of NCDs, nutrition, prevention of overweight and obesity, or a national more specific and comprehensive policy for the reduction of salt and sodium intake. Second, presence or absence of regulatory measures regarding salt, such as, for example, taxes on food with a high content of sodium, and uh, the promotion of uh, foodstuffs uh, without sodium uh, that is used uh, by our children and uh, social labeling that includes uh, the definition of uh, the sodium content. Then the definition of a policy in line with the recommendations, uh, one of the mo most uh, cost efficient um, recommendations by WHO. Some results. Uh, well, first of all, we hope that this review will be used as a baseline and as a live document that will be updated as countries move forward in their efforts in order to implement strategies to reduce uh, sodium intake in the population. The report includes uh, recommendations from the Technical Advisory Group of APAHO that led to, to this regional initiative in salt reduction since 2019. Also responses in the survey that I mentioned, PAHO 2016, which included questionnaire for 20 countries and we received a response from 17 countries now. 
most of the answers were not complete or did not include a link to the policies or initiatives. And that is why we carried out a review per country profile. After the review, we prepared country profiles with data collected from 34 countries and a brief questionnaire to assess the status of implementation of the policy. During that stage, we received answers from 10 countries. We found that at least uh, three countries include a recommendation in order to reduce uh, sodium consumption within more general policies, such as national development policies. Seven countries in public health uh, policies. Most of the countries include a recommendation in their control and prevention of NCDs, uh, their policies, that is to say 24 countries had this recommendation, 14 in nutrition policies and six countries have a national comprehensive and specific plan for the reduction of sodium intake. As far as we know, no country in the region has a tax policy aimed at directly at foodstuffs with a high sodium content. However, in 2014, Mexico implemented a tax of 8% over non-essential food with high calorie content, including salty food. Regarding policies that restrict the marketing of these products, only five countries have implemented this measure. They all include limits on sodium content, but the scope of the restrictions varies. Some countries use open TV, restricted other movies or other school means. For nutritional labeling, only 10 countries that demand the nutritional labeling of foods, packaged foods, include the sodium content per portion or per grams in size. Then we have nutritional labeling, such as a fat, a sodium, and sugar, which is essential for that. This is a somewhat busy slide. I don't uh, hope but that you will see everything in detail, but this is essentially how we summarize our findings and we assign a symbol in order to identify the condition in each country. For example, if the country has a national policy, whether there was a sub-regional policy or whether it was underway, we believe that it was underway only when there was a law approved and the regulation was uh, pending. In fact, uh, I'd like uh, to highlight that, that we found that, that 16 countries have a specific initiatives for the reduction of uh, sodium in food, and they're in line with at least uh, one of the strategies that we mentioned previously, most uh, cost-effective strategies of uh, WHO. And thus, uh, we can see this uh, progress from one last review that was done on a global level in 2014 in some of the most uh, cost-effective initiatives recommended by WHO, so, such as a labor labeling a food, front labeling in 2014, we only had one country in the region that had an initiative. And in 2019, we have five countries that have this initiative and all in a mandatory way. Now, regarding reformulation of food in 2014, we had 14 countries with targets for reformulation of food. And in 2019, we have 12 countries that have some sort of an initiative. Regarding interventions in public environments, such as schools, in 2014, we had eight schools, and by 2019, it uh, came up to 13. Regarding monitoring and the level of sodium in food, 2014, 10 countries had uh, some sort of uh, work uh, done along these lines, and by 2019, we have information for 19 countries. This is uh, to see the progress uh, of these uh, policies in the course of these last few years, ever since uh, we launched uh, the regional Bajo initiative at the beginning of 2009. Only two countries in the Americas have reported on national activist strategies in order to reduce salt or sodium consumption in 2012. During phase two of this initiative, nine countries in the Americas had a strategy underway. In 2014, according to the Global Review, we knew that 14 countries in the Americas had a specific plan or an initiative underway to reduce uh, sodium intake. And at the beginning of 2019, and in keeping with the review that we performed, we have 16 countries in the Americas that have an initiative aimed at reducing sodium intake, but they're also in line with at least one of the best investments of WHO or the most cost-effective measures. We should say that other countries had activities linked to awareness-raising campaigns, monitoring, and these are detailed in the report. 
besides that there are some other countries that, that have initiatives underway in Central America, for example, we have uh, some in the planning stage because in January 2019, we adopted and launched a regional strategy for the reduction of sodium consumption in Central America and the Dominican Republic. How are we doing compared to other regions? This is a result of a systematic review that was just published where we cooperated with the data from our region. And as you can see, we have a comparison with 2014 and most of the regions have had progress in their policies and initiatives aimed at reducing sodium consumption. We are underway. We have several countries that already have initiatives, but we have to acknowledge that Europe does have an edge in initiatives for sodium reduction, and many more countries are enforcing that in their territories. Now, in 2015, we launched the regional goals where PAHO participated for a reduction in sodium content in food. At the time, we only had data for four countries and monitoring uh, data for very few countries. Now we're faced uh, with a different situation. There are many more countries that, that have goals in order to reduce uh, sodium in processed foods, and we have uh, monitoring data for 19 countries. In fact, uh, the last uh, country in having updated uh, its goals is Canada. And uh, when we come to the next slide, I'd like to share with you a little bit more about the Canadian experience. This shows that uh, the progress in consumption reduction in sodium in Canada. The reduction strategy 2016 for Canada includes a whole set of recommendations to reduce sodium intake of the population and included, for example, the development of a guide for the food industry on reducing sodium in processed foods. And what has been the progress with this initiative? Well, between 2016 and 2013, only 16.2% in the code of different food categories reduced sodium content. Likewise, from 2012 to 2016, we saw that only 14% in the different categories of food complied with the goals of reducing sodium. However, we have not reached the levels recommended for sodium intake. The latest shows an average consumption of 2,760 milligrams of sodium a day in Canada, and the goal they have is between 1,500 and 2,300 milligrams of sodium a day. Recently, Health Canada published an update in the objectives to reduce sodium in processed foods that will be enforced from 2020 onwards. These are some of the findings of Bajo's survey. We found that amongst the priorities for technical support for countries in Latin America, we have integration with a broader nutrition and NCDs agendas, nutritional interpretative labeling, such as front labeling of food, coordination between programs of salt consumption and uh, fortification, salt uh, fortified uh, food. And for countries in the Caribbean, monitoring of the intake of uh, sodium and identification of the main uh, nutritional sources. And when we saw the combined responses, we saw that uh, the technical support in monitoring salt intake and the main sources had the highest um, count. These are some of the recommendations of the Technical Advisory Group of APAHO for actions in the public sector to continue and or step up the efforts in order to achieve a relative reduction in 30% of the mean intake of sodium, which is a goal by 2025, to activate and promote the policies to protect and promote uh, more healthy diets and nutrition, to develop a regulatory models and fiscal tax policies for food with high sodium content to support cooperation amongst the stakeholders at a global, regional, national levels involved in salt reduction with groups that work in fortifying salt content. Some others to develop guidelines on conflicts of interest, particularly when there's interaction with the private sector to approach artisanal food, small vendors, small establishments that sell food and manufacturers of local foodstuffs. The need to have objectives for the reformulation of food that are stricter and that will deal in a relevant way with the subcategories of food in the different countries regarding monitoring to develop capacities to optimize the use of surveillance and methods and to adopt innovative technologies and approaches in order to do this. 
Papua has developed an interactive tool where you can find this information. Unfortunately, I cannot report on all of the results in such a short presentation, but this is online and you are welcome to look at it. Here, I want to show you a map. If you go in by country, you can see whether or not the country is in compliance and if it has or does not have a national initiative. Also, you will see if they have a regional or sub-regional level in line with the PAHO recommendations. And also, you, in keeping with the policy, can find information. We thought it was important to recognize the efforts of countries in general policy areas that recognize the reduction of sodium. All of that uh, recognizing that this is important for the population's health. Also, you can look at country profiles. This is organized as I already described, and there's access to policies in many cases. So in wrapping up, I can say that there have been significant strides in policy to reduce salt intake in the region of the Americas. No country has fully implemented the Best Buy policy of WHO. There are few countries that monitor the impact of policies or interventions that have been implemented. Also compare policies in the countries of a region that is so different, so diverse as the Americas is hard. Countries need technical support to monitor sodium intake and the major sources of salt, development of capacity, and also there has to be a broader agenda to integrate salt reduction with diet. Lastly, this review provides high level information on salt reduction initiatives in the region of the Americas. However, the data that has been gathered for this mapping of policies could be analyzed in greater detail to evaluate the status, the progress, the facilitators, and the barriers to implement these policies. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And this is my contact data. Thank you very much, Nadia. That was an excellent presentation. And the work is very interesting, very helpful. And I hope that this will encourage countries to accelerate their efforts in the area of salt reduction. Also that interactive tool is something that is very important. It's something that we'll be able to update frequently so that we can reflect progress. There's also a policy repository. It's a repository for both policies and laws, and it is helpful to countries. We will be sharing the link through the chat to that tool so that everyone can have access to it. Now, as Nadia was saying during her presentation, there's social marketing that is one of the best interventions of the cost effective uh, measures and it's part of the shake package now with us we have dr mamuda karlik pasha she is professor of the public health school at the university of south florida and also, she is part of the collaborating center of the WHO working in the area of marketing. She is especially interested in social marketing, especially its application to a great variety of public health matters, including non-communicable diseases. She has collaborated a lot with us in social marketing, salt reduction, and for other issues. We have a virtual course now as part of the virtual campus. So I am going to turn the floor over to Dr. Mamuda for her to tell us about these initiatives. Thank you, Leo. I hope you're able to see my screen. Um, Leo, if you can just let me know if they can see my screen. Um, yes, 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 yes. All right, great, thank you. Um, so good morning um, to everyone, and thank you, Leo, for the introduction. 
my presentation will be in um, English, but I believe you can um, switch to the Spanish translation. So that way then you can understand my, um, my, my overview of the work that we've done. Um, the focus of my presentation is to introduce you briefly to the work that we have been doing in the Latin America and the Caribbean region. So I'm going to share with you a high level overview of some of our key findings and recommendations. And then my fellow speakers are going to do a deeper dive in relation to sharing some of the information related to the work that they may have done at the country level. So first I'd like to share just a little bit of background regarding the organization that I represent. And so um, I am a professor at the University of South Florida and the University of South Florida has been at the forefront of social marketing research applied to help for many years. Um, the University of South Florida was designated as a World Health Organization Collaborating Center in 2014 and redesignated in 2018. And to date we have collaborated with PAHO on several projects investigating the use of social marketing to address non-communicable diseases and more importantly, building the capacity of the countries to apply social marketing. So as a WHO Collaborating Center, our mission is to address the um, growing problem with non-communicable diseases by capitalizing on the strengths of social marketing and social change strategies. And the way we go about doing this is there's three pillars for our center, those related to training and technical assistance, and then also building the capacity and knowledge of countries around the region. So you may be asking, um, before I dive into, what is exactly social marketing? So social marketing, uh, in a nutshell, or just briefly, it seeks to develop an integrated marketing concept with other approaches to influence behavior that benefit the individual and the communities for greater social good. Our goal is to use marketing tools to promote sustainable and positive change. And we go about doing this by having our focus be on the person or being human centered. Any of our work is guided by research and then we use the marketing techniques as a way to go about developing the intervention um, and you know, selling it or marketing it to the population. I'm just going to look in the chat because I see some, there's things popping up and I just want to make sure. Okay. I hope you. Yes, it, it seems that everyone can hear now in, in English. So. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so the, some of the distinctive features of social marketing, and you're going to hear a lot about this as I share with you the research findings that we had, is that we really focus on the consumer, getting a better understanding. So how do we go about focusing on the consumer that is from the perspective of doing the research or listening to them? Once we listen to the consumer, we use the listening or the research as a way to go about selecting a behavioral target, um, selecting a priority population, and then understanding what, are, what is the competition. So why are individuals not uh, engaging in a particular behavior? In this case, using less salt in their cooking or even for policymakers introducing policies that reformulate um, you know, products that may have. So getting a better understanding of this information, we go about then developing an integrated marketing mix or a strategy for the population. So while my presentation today is not going to focus on social marketing itself, I wanted to give you this brief overview before I take a dive into the work that we have been doing with many countries throughout the region. So as you may know, um, as we've been discussing and the previous presentation will be focused on that, you know, addressing salt, um, reducing sodium consumption is a complex issue. Um, and it's complex because using salt or um, sodium is a daily challenge behavior. Um, it's something that uh, requires constant maintenance because we're exposed to it through our daily household or diet as well as in our social sphere. The other aspect of um, reducing the amount of salt that we use is that it's any intervention or any work that we do it has to be multi-level. And the multi-level means focusing on not only the purchasing behaviors, how we make our food, also looking at how we access different products, but then also looking at the policy environment overall. So anything that you do has to be more context specific and it involves multiple levels of it. 
And so the diversity of points through which salt enters the diet implies that behavior change efforts should not just be limited to things at the individual level. So looking at this, um, you know, consumer education alone is not going to go about um, influence pe influencing people to change their behavior. Um, so just telling them the information and for much of the research that we did, at times what we found is that people have information related to salt in terms of the negative impacts of it, but the information that is lacking is the how in terms of how they go about doing it. And so social marketing can be a useful tool for the design of interventions. Specifically, it can help to go about decreasing the demand for salt um, and, uh, or high salt products. It can generate demand for low salt alternatives. And it can also be used as a way to go about influencing um, the policy environment. So to design these programs, um, so in short, the social marketing can help us to move beyond just public awareness or just education and designing comprehensive programs that can actually go about moving the lever towards changing behaviors. So in order to go about working towards this, we have been collaborating with the Pan American Health Organization and multiple partners throughout the region. We embarked on two specific initiatives uh, over the past um, eight years or so to go about applying social marketing techniques to the region to see about what we're able to develop. So one of the first projects that we did, I'm not going to go into the details of the slide, is that from 2015 to 2017, we worked with four countries in the Caribbean region um, to work on not only increasing the country's capacity to apply social marketing, but also in translating the social marketing into an actual intervention. And I'm going to share some information pertaining to that in um, the, um, the results that I will share with you. The other major endeavor that we had was uh, working with four countries from the Latin America region. And that was, again, fun it was funded by the International Development Research Center. And this focused, again, on developing a social marketing strategy related to um, decreasing the amount of salt that people were using in their diet. So overall in our work that we did in the Caribbean, as well as in Latin America, once we worked with the various country partners, the major project goals that we ended up establishing was to go about developing communication messages and strategies that aim to decrease the demand for salt and high sodium ingredients used in household preparation and consumption. So applying the social marketing lens, the behavioral focus that um, the country selected was to focus on uh, the segment of the population, which is primarily the mother. And what they focused on was reducing the amount of salt that she was using within the household. Along with the mothers, there were other partners that were in the mix, such as secondary audiences, the fathers, the children, as well as the larger community. So that was the primary audience that uh, we segmented in, uh, around. And so what the focus of the work in both regions, in the Caribbean and the Latin America, was really conducting research with this target population, as well as stakeholders, to better understand how do we go about positioning using less salt in your household, and what are some strategies that we can use to go about enc encouraging it. This is just an image from one of the projects and some of the um, leaders who were working together with us in terms of going about um, developing this strategy. So now I wanted to share with you a little bit about some of the major research findings that we had. And again, keep in mind, these research findings I'm sharing with you are very broad level, high level um, findings that we really gleaned from the literature as well as from the research that we conducted, not only in the Caribbean region, as well as um, in the Latin America region. So one of the things that we found is that the core benefits for, um, you know, uh, for cooking with salt was that, uh, the, for reducing salt was that it was, it was related to the aspect of cooking with less salt as a way to care and nurture for the family. The other benefit that was identified by the population was that by using less salt or using substitute materials that the mother or whoever the caregiver who's preparing the food would be more creative and would be more innovative in the way that they go about using the product. Another core benefit that was identified by the population was that it was a way to stay healthy or to stay in good shape. So those are some of the benefits that the population shared as to why using less salt um, would be of help to them. There were many barriers shared as to why they do not 
are not unable to do. And many of the barriers we're very much familiar with since we all are involved in the aspect of you know, cooking within our household. But the barriers that we really focus on was the increased consumption of processed food, um, so sauces that are high in um, sodium, particularly among the children, and then also the, also the habit of um, adding salt to already prepared foods. And there were some other um, constraints or barriers that are mentioned on the slide as it relates to not having enough time, um, uh, mature food that they prepared that was traditional, and then also associating salty food with food that tastes good. Um, one of the interesting findings here is that uh, one of the main drivers for how this was happening is that kids were making quite a lot of decisions, especially in the Caribbean um, context, what came about is that the kids were driving the decision as it pertained to what was happening within the household as it related to food. And so that was one of the key elements that we looked at from the perspective of um, you know, the mothers um, and the family and the household in terms of how do we incorporate this component of the children um, down the, as, uh, uh, to go about a TV long-term change. Other results from the formative findings was when we asked them about, well, where are they making the decisions as it relates to salt? It was what we already know in the household, in the supermarkets when they're selecting the products, and also as it relates to children within the school settings and using canteens and other. And when we asked them in terms of how should the information be communicated, the focus was on using traditional media and social media sources, as well as healthcare providers, and then also spokespersons such as celebrity chefs, grandmothers or other people that are respected within the community. So this is just to give you a big picture of the key insights that we gathered from the, um, the research. So now how we translated the, um, the insights is that as we were looking at the uh, research and thinking about it, what we wanted to see is that what are the main insights, what are the main reasons for why people continue to use salt and where there are barriers to reducing the salt. One of the first things that we identified is the emotional attachment to tradition. So the tradition of cooking food the way they are because that's just passed down the generation. The other aspect was the perception that healthy food that may be low in salt or sodium or may not be as tasty as other foods that they're familiar so that the taste would be bland. Um, another key insight that we found is that the mother or the caregiver expresses their love by way of cooking for their family. So if they make a food that's tasty and their family values it or eats it, then they're expressing their love and they're showing that they care for the family. And then the other thing that we found or the key insight from the research was that there was low risk perception. So no one seems to know um, about how much salt to use and but where all the salt is coming from in their um, diet. And I think you'll hear about this later in one of the other presentations about this. So along with the insights, what we also wanted to see is uh, what are the dri demand dri drivers? So what is really going to um, push the person forward or um, the lever for getting them to go about changing their behavior? Some of the levers for changing their behavior is that they can think about it from the perspective of that I can end the cycle of chronic disease or cardiovascular disease in my family. I will be able to set a good example for my children so down the line they can continue with the habits that I establish. Cooking with less salt is a way to show my family that I love and care for them and that we will be in a better shape, physical shape, mental shape overall, um, if we are to um, you know, use less salt. And then also another component for a uh, demand driver, which I mentioned to you previously, is this opportunity to be creative, to be innovative, and to try something different. And this goes into the aspect of making changes to the recipe by way of substituting different ingredients or making the recipes that are traditional recipes in a different way, but relying on different ingredients rather than solely relying on salt. So those are, that's, those are some of the key insights or the demand um, drivers that we were looking at as a way to go about um, developing the concept or the approach for our social marketing campaign. So one of the first buckets, as I mentioned to you, was focus on the aspect of tradition. Um, so this tradition focused on the loyalty, emotional attachment to the traditionals and the pride in making the dishes the way they are, and then also relying on salt. So here's the concept that we came up with. And remember, these concepts that I'm sharing are very much at the draft level. 
all the countries are to take this information um, and translate it to their own country context based on what's going on. So this is more at a regional level than what I'm sharing with you at this moment. So the concept in this category was about caregivers' loyalty and emotional attachment to traditional traditions, including traditional recipes and meals passed down through the family of generations. Based on the insight that no one wants to sacrifice tradition, concepts were developed that suggested creating a new healthier family tradition. The headline for the concept board, create a new family tradition, while the tagline or the call to action reads, reduce heart disease by reducing salt. The key visual is a stock image that we use from an online uh, library, and it shows three generations of family, in this case males, but it could be female or others as well. Following in line with this again, um, this is again the family and the tradition. Uh, this one says, give her the best life, leave out the heart disease, reduce salt. So again, the aspect of focusing on that family, the traditional and emotional attachment and changing that. One of the other key insights, as I mentioned to you, was related to that taste. So salt equals flavor, less salt equals less flavor. And then the fear from the mother or the caregiver of the rejection of the, um, the of family in not eating the food. So here's an example of um, you know, uh, uh, one of the concepts that we developed. This addresses the taste barrier and focuses on the desired behavior of focusing on salt substitutes. It would be a good title, say, for a cookbook also, what you see on here. Um, what this led to is the creation of a concept that focuses on the replacement behavior, suggesting that caregivers prepare family meals, replacing salt and high sodium condiments with other more natural ingredients. This concept also addresses fear of the family rejection and the link between taste and salt by communicating that using these natural ingredients will result in tasty meals that the whole family will enjoy. The two word headline, Salva Vidas, is a word on the uh, word lifesaver, play on the word lifesaver in Spanish, and the picture natural condiments such as lemon, onions, and garlic. Um, the English, English translation of the tagline, call to action is less salt and more life, cook with more natural ingredients. And this is just an example from the Caribbean um, a work that we did. Again, the same concept was carried through, and I wanted to just kind of pull that into this as well. So the third bucket that we spoke about was how much love, so how you show love. Um, my cooking shows my love towards my family and the strong motivation to protect the family and children. So this is the concept that we came up with. Um, um, and the research across the four country, countries, this is particularly from um, Latin America, but also in the Caribbean, showed that caregivers view cooking for their families as an act of love. Mothers and some fathers take great pride in preparing meals that they know that their children will love. At the same time, research revealed that there's a little understanding exactly how much salt to use in food preparation. This led to the creation of a concept that marries the emotional benefit of demonstrating your love by preparing meals for your family um, that your family will love with practical means intended with this concept. So it's, this is saying little salt means a lot of love. The key visual is a memorable visual or mnemonic device that shows a female hand using two fingers to flavor food with a pinch of salt. The headline says the right amount of love, while the tagline call to action says reverse your salt habit. So the last one was a secret source, and this is a below risk perception related to not understanding where um, salt is coming from. And so um, when we spoke to the, uh, the um, individuals, many of them were saying that, you know, they use moderate amount of salt, but they didn't really have a good understanding of where the salt was coming from. And so here you'll see on this concept as a play on, you know, just the word, um, you know, uh, salt, but also salsa for the tomato, um, ketchup, just showing that there's hidden salt um, in the day-to-day -day dishes. This is just one example, but this salt could be, this could be applied to other um, condiments and other dishes that people use as a way to really illustrate the hidden salt, but then also showing, um, giving them an understanding of kind of quantifying how that salt is coming from. This is again from Latin America. And here's just an example from the Caribbean where they did a play on the aspect of um, having um, Caribbean mothers be able to control the bully. And the bully they used is because in the Caribbean, there was a 
heavy use of the bullion cube um, in that. And so they wanted the mothers to, they did a play on that word, so that you can control the bully in some respect. Um, so they didn't want to, they wanted to personify the salt as a bully who tries to dominate under ingredients. And so the goal is to reinforce the idea that salt is not necessarily, um, you know, bad, but that you can substitute or control, substitute other ingredients and control the salt in that. So I'm just going to show you um, a, this, they came up with this um, uh, animated concept in one of the design workshops that we did, which is basically showing, you know, salt in a nightclub and it's just dominating the entire dance floor. Um, and then as you go, there's other ingredients that are coming in. Um, and then, you know, they just said, sorry, I don't date salt, but you'll see the salt is getting sidelined to the side a little bit. And the other ingredients that can be used as substitutes are being introduced into the mix. And then at the end, they're all dancing together on the dance floor, but you have a mix of the salt. So this was again, a concept that the Caribbean um, uh, folks came up with in one of our design workshops as a way to say, how can we go about getting this information out to the community and translating it? Um, so here's um, the final end of that video, kind of showing, um, you know, and playing on the aspect of the tradition um, introducing the colors and then the food still tasting um, as good as it would taste if you just primarily use salt. But if you introduce the other ingredients, it would still taste um, the same. So I just wanted to kind of give you a big picture overview of some of the work that we have been accomplishing in the region for the past couple of years. Um, and now I'm going to move it on to some of my um, colleagues who are going to share with you more of the details at the country level as it relates to Peru, but then also um, for Costa Rica. One thing I just wanted to plug before I um, end my presentation is that we are right now working with um, individuals from the Caribbean as well as Latin America in increasing their capacity to apply social marketing. So we have a program on the PAHO virtual campus and with examples from this work and other work that we have. And so I would encourage you to look that up. If you have any questions, my email address is here. I would be happy to respond to any in the question and answer session. And then also I just wanted to acknowledge that um, you know, acknowledge PAHO and our other partners, but also much of the work that you saw and this um, presentation came from our work in Latin America and the support from the International Development Research Center. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Mahmouda. Excellent uh, presentation. Um, bueno, queda claro que... Thank you, Mahmouda. Thank you for your excellent presentation. It's clear that social marketing can be an effective strategy and often that is what we need in communication campaigns. We need informative research, planning. We need to know exactly what problem we're targeting, but by following a systematic planning process using social marketing, we can get much better results. Those who haven't yet done so, you should take the social marketing course. It is free of charge. It's available on the Public Health Virtual Campus webpage. It's available in both English and Spanish. 3,000 people have taken the introductory course. And right now, the second course is available for those who have taken that first course. So with an eye on the schedule and the clock, we can go on to the next presentation. It will be given by Lorena Saavedra. And she is a nutritionist. She has a, a master's degree in nutrition metabolism. And she works with the Center of Excellence in Chronic Disease at the Cayetano Heredia University in Peru. Lorena, please go ahead. Good morning and good afternoon for those watching us. Today, I will show you the development of a social marketing strategy in order to reduce discretionary salt consumption in Peruvian families. This was a survey that was done in cooperation with a whole group of institutions in a project financed by IDRC, and we were guided by Dr. Mahmouda and her team. 
So we will now show you the social marketing strategy. In the case of Peru, this was concentrated on reducing the discretionary use of salt. We have a special interest in reducing the quantity of salt that is used in food that we cook in our local cuisine. As we know very well, the Peruvian gastronomy at an international level is quite flavorful and varied, but it is also characterized because it has a high salt content. You can see several dishes at typical food food that, that are well known and dear to our population, but that has a high salt content. So the question that we would have to ask is how much discretional salt is used by Peruvians? Do we have to reduce it or not? As part of the studies that we've carried out, we found that, for, for example, in the north of Peru, which is an area, a part of the country where we eat a lot of ceviche, for those of you who know it, it is a seasoned with a lemon, with a salt, with a pepper and salty fish. Salt consumption is around 11 grams a day, which definitely surpasses in more than twice the recommendations that we have. Instead of sources of what are the main sources of salt, in some studies we found that the processed food and ultra processed food represents a 40% of the salt that comes from food. And this in Lima, where nutritional transition is being sharper and there's a higher consumption of processed and ultra processed food. The rest would then come from discretional use of salt. On the other hand, we've also seen that our population in general has strong a tradition of a local foods and it would be difficult to reduce at the high level of discretion of salt that we're using in Peru. We carried out uh, chronics in our research center and we have a study that was done in order to learn about the motivators and the barriers in reducing salt consumption within uh, some areas in Lima and a close area that is El Callao. I will explain a bit what this uh, study was all about that later on gave rise uh, to the social marketing strategy. Well, as I said, our purpose was to identify the movers and the barriers in order to reduce the salt consumption that was added in preparing food at home in order to have a social marketing plan. In this study, both their parents and, and mothers uh, participated in preschool children. We changed a bit the study within Latin America where most of the countries concentrated on mothers in school age children. However, we were interested in learning about the role of fathers and to focus on families with preschool children because they're a bit more sensitive to these changes and we were concerned about the health of children and their families. The study was done in educational institutions at initial level in some districts in Lima and Callao in 2018. We carried out a study, mixed method study. We had focal groups uh, as well as in-depth uh, interviews, but also questionnaires in order to circumvent the methodologies that, that will provide much more consistent results. We included some issues within these guides and interviews, such as who are the decision makers on the food that is prepared at home? What are the practices, the preparation? We also assess the perception on salt consumption and the relation between salt consumption and health to know how much people knew about the impact of salt. And we also included as part of the interviews and questionnaires, a brief test of a possible promotional materials who could be the spokespersons who would be responsible for the promotion of the social marketing strategy and what would be the preferred promotion channels. Most of the participants were women, we included the people between the ages of 18 and 61, most of them married, with a level of higher education of around 35%. I will now show you part of the results of this study together with the social marketing strategy that was in the hands of a group of communicators headed by Vilamina Pons. Well, what did we find as part of the study? And later on, this was a transfer to the insights of the campaign, the social marketing campaign. We found as barriers the following. We found that the salty food was considered as 
good tasting food. We also found that there was internal fear in trying a new food, a new way of seasoning the food. We found that many women were using condiment type of cubes, bouillons, such as a little bouillon cubes and other in powder, and that enabled them to ensure the tasty flavor of food. On the other hand, we also found that there were afraid, as Dr. Mahmouda said, to rejecting food. They were afraid of that because they thought that their husbands and children were not going to eat that food without little salt because it was not that tasty. We also found that the main competitors were artificial spices, particularly these cubes and artificial seasoners in powder. On the other hand, as a part of the motivators, we found that uh, diversion could be an ally. We found that the women who cook at home cooked uh, while they sung, they were singing, listening to the radio, they danced, uh, they used their cell phone while they were cooking. And we also found uh, that uh, within the, those who could be our allies at uh, the secondary target group where we had uh, husbands or children, because they were asked about what uh, they were cooking or what they felt like eating uh, throughout the week. However, it's important to point out that even though we were consulting the husbands and the children, it was a woman who ultimately decided what was going to be served at home. On the other hand, we also found some families that had attempted to reduce salt consumption, but above all, these were families where they had a member of the family that was uh, somewhat older and had had uh, some underlying conditions. We found that they had, uh, in fact, attempted to change uh, salt consumption, and this change uh, was uh, done for the entire family as a preventative measure. Something else that was interesting is that, that they are well acquainted with the relation between salt and health. They're not acquainted with the mechanisms, but they do know that it can rise up for uh, blood pressure. And they also think that uh, as part of the spokesperson or the people who could be part of the campaigns, we could have some authorized voices such as health and personnel. But it was even more interesting to see that those who could be the main spokesperson could be the image of a grandmother because uh, their grandmother brings uh, the traditional age old recipes, family recipes, and they're well acquainted with how to prepare a delicious uh, food, uh, healthy food. But we also saw that uh, people didn't uh, care whether they were men or women. And we could also offer some recommendations to cook with less salt, but uh, still being flavorful and tasty. The target uh, audience were women. We characterize this woman as a woman between 18 and 45 years of age that is responsible for cooking or making decisions about what is cooked at home. Someone had um, a, a person at home that was responsible for cooking the food that, that was ordered by the mother. They had younger children between the ages of three to five, different socioeconomic level. We should point out that we included different socioeconomic levels because we wanted to try to cover the largest segment of the population that we have. We've, we have people with very high economic strata, but also low, many people who migrate and they bring their traditions and their habits and their customs. And that is why we wanted to, to encompass as many people as possible. The secondary audience, we agree with what Mahmouda presented. We had children, husbands, and we also included teachers, school teachers. We have a quote of what a mother told us. I can ask my husband, what do you want me to cook today? But the one who makes it, the decision is yours truly. So what we wanted to do was to aim our study in mothers. The objectives regarding behavior, we wanted to add natural spices, condiments in order to highlight uh, the taste of food, uh, to reduce the quantity of salt, uh, as to believe some we see that natural condiments uh, highlight uh, the flavor of food, just like salt. Uh, it is easy to use uh, natural seasonings in preparing your food stuff. It is not uh, difficult. Uh, you don't need to know a lot. And also the amount of salt uh, that is currently used is also moderate. We also had as a purpose regarding knowledge that we wanted them to use natural seasoning in preparing food, that they learn how to combine the seasoning and also to have other elements or ingredients that could be mixed with salt 
for them to be ready to use. And here we have the creative concept that was designed by a communicator based on the formative uh, study. You can see that what we're seeking here is to show that the use of natural condiments that you have here to the right shows uh, much uh, taster, colorful, happy food compared to one that could have only a high content of salt or, or artificial seasoning, which is um, much uh, boring and perhaps uh, not healthy, harmful. That is why we place it in a darker color. So based on everything we found in the study and the creative uh, study, we prepared the marketing and mixture of the four original P's, product, the price, uh, promotion, and the place. This uh, is uh, the marketing strategy, and then I will talk about each one of them. Regarding the product, uh, what we were offering was uh, a tangible product. Uh, we had a kit of natural condiments, uh, spices, and herbs. Uh, we wanted to have a positioning of this uh, within the kitchen through a sample showing that the kitchen could be joyful, amusing, entertaining, and also to have foods or tools that, that will help use these, such as a, a spice a containers, a, a ladle, or teaspoons. The price, well, they were worried about reducing the cost and other barriers. The place where schools, so let us recall that the strategy was developed before the pandemic, so we thought that schools could be a good place for this and our teachers could then become our allies teachers and health centers and then last but not least the word promotion we believe that the ideal spokesperson would be the grandmother chefs and social networks as a preferred channel we realized that mothers were delighted by watching youtube it was uh, their preferred um, medium. And so we developed uh, videos, instructions, uh, quick uh, recipes, etc. And now I will tell us a little more about uh, each one of these uh, pieces. So regarding the product, uh, I already mentioned that the idea was to sell a creative, happy kitchen using natural spices. And for that, it is recommended that you have a tangible product, not only an idea or a behavior, because social marketing is a change in behavior, but also to present uh, something of a traditional marketing, which would be the tangible product. Are you selling a kit of natural uh, uh, spices, uh, which will be used uh, to bring out uh, the good taste of uh, my food? Well, you can add a teaspoon and the colors are important. Regarding price, the lack of uh, taste uh, worried uh, mothers, uh, the rejection if it didn't taste too good. However, we had the support in some cases that uh, doctors uh, were recommending that those families that had a relative uh, with a chronic disease to reduce salt consumption. So we could also use that as an ally. And on the other hand, uh, in some families that uh, they believed uh, that they were eating a sufficient salt, uh, that it was not necessary to reduce consumption because it was quite moderate. We have a quote from a mother who said that their consumption was quite moderate. That is to say what has to be in the food. How much was that? We didn't know. We had this limitation in the study because we were not able to assess uh, salt consumption in these uh, people. It was simply self-reported. Regarding place, uh, we believe uh, that uh, we could transfer messages over the radio, the internet and social networks. Uh, these uh, families uh, were consumers of information both through health centers as well as uh, schools. So we thought that the school could also be an ally or become one. So as not to continue with a traditional message in health, that the health was to be obtained through the same health or personnel, but to transfer a bit more to other sectors such as the education sector. We also wish to remind you that small children usually see their teachers as their heroes, as their ideals, not only their relatives and their families, but they start seeing their teachers as their ideal, the behavior that has to be imitated and followed or emulated. So we thought that they could be very good allies. I also said that mothers were looking for a lot of information on the internet. They were looking for recipes and advice over the networks. 
And also we realized that, that they did trust that the health of personnel. And last but not least for promotion, we selected a very amusing tone. We did not try to appeal to fear. It is a tool that is widely used and we see that with COVID nowadays. We wanted to show something healthy, amusing and pleasant to, to taste. This would not be amazing. And then the voices authorized, that is to say the spokespersons could be the grandmother as well as a chef. And um, under this point, there were some differences regarding the results of the study. Those sectors of a lower socioeconomic level preferred to have a grandmother as a spokesperson, while other sectors, uh, the highest uh, sectors, uh, preferred a chef, uh, irrespective of whether man or woman, and that would be the person who would tell you how to eat uh, healthier, but also with a good taste, uh, good flavor. Now, regarding information channels, uh, well, we had uh, tutorials, uh, videos, but as I said in the questionnaire, we also used uh, these uh, trying to find out other sources to disseminate information. And here we're showing these um, magnets for the refrigerator. This could be very practical because they had it in front of them when cooking. Also to have a recipe in the kitchen, virtual recipes, as well as physical recipes, and then uh, cooking classes. Most of these uh, within the classes believed uh, that this could be done face-to-face uh, -face in schools and in person. And maybe this is a point to be assessed uh, during the pandemic. Perhaps uh, now the communication channels after the pandemic, uh, perhaps I uh, would uh, resort more to virtual channels. We would have to assess that. And finally, we have some promotional ideas that we had to do direct marketing through demonstrations in schools or health centers, some affairs and school and competitions and schools, a promotional event, the launch, for example, the return of the grandmother in order to promote the cooking secrets, the traditional cooking secrets. And within promotional materials, we would have collections of recipes and announcements. This is what we've proposed as a social marketing strategy. Regrettably, because of the pandemic, we were not able to enforce this, but we had the intention of transferring this to real life. So if you have any comments or any questions, those will be welcome at the end of the webinar, and you can address any questions if you send anything to my email. Thank you very much. Lorena. Uh Muy, muy bueno. Thank you very much, Lorena. That was very interesting. This shows how social marketing can be used in a specific context. And that uh, this is a way of using the grandmother's recipes to still prepare healthy dishes. I hope that we'll be able to go over our time a bit because we are behind schedule. So please continue to send your questions through the Q&A. I'm now going to call on Dr. Adriana Blanco. She is a researcher at the Costa Rican Institute for Research and Teaching in Nutrition and Health in Ciencia in Costa Rica. Plus, she is the member of the Technical Advisory Group of PAHO for Salt Reduction. And she's going to be talking about salt content in street foods, artisan foods, and fast food. So please go ahead, Adriana. Thank you. And thank you, Leo, for introducing me. I imagine that some of you may be wondering How much sodium is in a given food in our region? And that is precisely our topic for today. The content and this research was carried out as part of an IDRC project that has already been mentioned, calling scaling and evaluating policies and programs for salt reduction in the countries of Latin America. The objective was to promote uh, policy innovations to reduce sodium in the food systems of the countries of the region by scaling up and evaluating 
policy strengthening and by instituting programs in different countries of Latin America. This program has five components. You already heard about food behavior, and now I'm going to be talking about the food environment. The problem is that our countries have initiatives, as Nadia showed you, 19, actually 16 right now, but many of those initiatives are uh, working with limited data availability, their scientific capability is limited, and the inefficient transfer of knowledge for decision making in the area of health. Now, what is the importance of this type of food? First of all, this type of food is increasing in our countries, and that is because we have more people that leave, live in urban areas, unemployment, long distances between work and home, and also a demand for cheap foods that are culturally appropriate close to the workplace. Now, food on streets is consumed, according to a study in Latin America, by 53.6% of the population. And that consumption is greater amongst young people. Why? Because it's cheaper, because they're short on time, so they buy food on the street. According to FAO, Latin American families spend at least 30% of their expenditures on street food, tourists like this type of food, and this food is usually prepared by women. That is how they make a living. Also in terms of artisan foods, you know that there is something that is quite fashionable now, that is consuming artisan foods, and this creates a public health problem that goes beyond uh, food safety. It has more to do with the nutritional components of that food. Now, our objective is to share with the scientific community and decision making makers the results of these studies carried out in the five different countries of Latin America. This is the team. We have Dr. Saman, Dr. Sonia, from the University of Sao Paulo, Eliana Eduardo Purgato, Geraldine Moningo, Jose Acosta, Lorena Saavedra, Mayra Mesa from Peru, and in Costa Rica, Maria Montero, Carlo Benavides, and I was the general coordinator of the project at the regional level. So that was the Costa Rica team. Now, what steps did we follow? First of all, we did a diagnosis. This was directed, led by Costa Rica, and there the laboratories worked with us. We evaluated the laboratories according to their experimental conditions. What type of water were they using? What type of equipment did they have? We looked at staffing. We we're trying to identify critical points that we could work on before running the tests so as to try to accomplish improvements. One important element was water quality. Some of the labs were using distilled water and not bio-distilled water. Then once that part was accomplished, we went to the interlaboratory rounds. All the countries, all the laboratories took part in two interlaboratory rounds. The materials came from Costa Rica and they were prepared by the PRIDA, that is a, a laboratory analysis uh, done under the University of Costa Rica. So these materials were sent to all the laboratories taking part. Then we selected uh, the foods that we wanted to sample and analyze. Here it was important to standardize definitions. We had uh, previous definitions, and this is something that countries worked on with their experts. And then lastly, we had the lab analysis, the results of the lab analysis. We identified the samples and we used pictures we used forms for Latin foods, 
identifying the sampling technique, the assay techniques, and then in analyzing results, we use the nutritional profile under the traffic light system of the United Kingdom. We use PAHO indicators too, because we had not analyzed energy. We needed energy information, but this is what we used. Now, what were the definitions? Street foods are food for consumption provided by vendors on the streets uh, that sell in the outdoors. The artisan foods use no additives or uh, preservatives, and they're not sold on the street. You know that some of the street foods are actually artisan foods, but that was the definition that we used to keep them separate. And then fast food sold at cafeterias, uh, takeout, and chains. Now, this is the sampling diagram. We had the laboratories doing 20 different types of analyses, artisan, street, and fast. Now, it's not just taking one small sample. The samples were taken from four different places in the, car, in the case of artisan food, and the samples are taken on three different occasions. And then in each uh, locale, we have what we call a compound sample, and that is analyzed in duplicate in the lab. And in this case, for a food, just one artisan food, we had 12 compound samples to be analyzed. So you can imagine if you multiply that by 20, it's quite a bit. This is so you can see how lengthy the process of doing all of these analysis is. We look at uh, humidity, then we look at ash, and lastly, we look at sodium association, and that takes something like two weeks for each food. When you use a compound, compound sample for each sample, you can have several compound samples and they can be analyzed in a single run. Now, what can we say about street food? Here for each country, and I'm just going to read off some examples in Argentina, the papuchas, uh, the chicken uh, skewer, the beef skewer, the pupusa in Costa Rica, the meat empanada, Paraguay, chimpanc, in Peru, the anticuchos, and uh, popcorn. And then for artisan food, we had the cheese and the goat cheese empanada, the pan de queso. Then here in Costa Rica, we had the cheese tortilla, the sweetbreads, arroz chaufa in Peru, and also um, grilled chicken. So here you can see these foods in picture form. Also under fast food, we have pizza, we have lomito from Argentina, French fries, Brazil, pizza too, chicken, Costa Rica, potato chips, uh, French fries from a fast food chain, then also hamburgers in the case of Paraguay, and hamburgers and pizza in Peru. And some products are similar across countries. They're fast food, and they were selected by each country. Now, what were the main results? For each country, I'm going to be giving you a summary. We are going to first look at artisan food. Second, we have the street food and fast food. And then in red, we have above 600 milligrams per 100 grams of product. Those are the high salt foods according to the traffic right system that we used for our nutrient profile. 
And then we have those that are medium in content, 120 up to 600. And you can see that here we only have one product that's low in sodium in Argentina. Most of them are medium salt content. Now the choripan, for example, is high. And here, uh, chicken with a salad. Everything depends, for example, in the case of choripan. In Brazil, we have uh, some products that are very high in salt content. Salami, for example, but we have a meat empanada that is high. Also a mortadella sandwich, it too has a lot of salt. So generally speaking, there here we see no low salt products. In the case of uh, Uruguay, Paraguay, I'm sorry, we see a lot of products that are high in salt content. Nothing is low in salt. In the case of Peru, we have some products that are high, the chaufa, the chicharron, the pork rinds. And in the case of Costa Rica, we don't have anything that is very high, nothing above the red line. We only have the blue line, which is at 120, and some projects like the health, the salty um, bread. So with all of this data, we drew up an average per country that gives us the number of samples analyzed or sampled in each country. And we see the percentage that is low, medium, and high in artisan, street, and fast. Now, just at first glance, you can see that Brazil has in artisanal street and fast food, they have a high percentage of foods that are high in salt. And in Paraguay has a highest consumption of sodium out of the five countries. And also they have the highest rate of high blood pressure. In the case of Costa Rica, Argentina and Peru, most of the products are intermediate in terms of salt content. Now, what did we do with these materials and these results? The first thing we did was we prepared a policy brief and we worked on it as a group of five countries. And here we have the information, the results of the project in a very straightforward, not technical fashion, but uh, addressing decision makers, basically. And this is something that each country shared with its authorities. It is available, here it is. It is in the digital library. This is the link of the IDRC. And there you'll be able to see all of the different materials referred to by the other speakers. For example, here, Argentina. Argentina sent data back to producers, Costa Rica, worked with the people that have to do with gastronomy to try to implement actions. And here in Costa Rica, we provided this data. And here we use the FDA cutoff points to talk about portions, milligrams per portion. This is a sheet of paper that you can use as a placemat. So for example, we can teach children how much salt is in the food that the child is eating. Lastly, conclusions or recommendations, the artisan, the street, the fast foods are an important source of salt in the diet. And they can make a significant contribution to the total amount of sodium consumed by the population, especially in low income groups. It is urgent to take action to resuit reduce the content of salt in and provide guidance, uh, put this into our health programs, etc. Lastly, I wanted to thank the IDRC of Canada. They finance Lorena and Dr. Mamuda's uh, studies. Also, I want to thank Inciencia. They provided us with the human resources and they supported us with transportation. Here you can see the different executing agencies, the five countries with the names of the members of the teams, also the people that provided technical 
support the University of Toronto, the University of Ontario, University Laval. And here is my contact information. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Adriana. That was an excellent presentation. I can see how important street food is in terms of salt intake. So we definitely need to take into account all of the sources of salt. It is 12 o'clock, but my suggestion is that we do another 15 minutes so as to be able to respond to all of the different questions. So I'm going to be asking the panelists to please be brief in their answers. I have a question here that I want to ask Nadia. It's a question that comes from Dr. Manuel. Let's see if I can find it. And the question is, how do we measure the effect of implementing these policies? It comes from Manuel Ramirez Sea from Guatemala, in Cape. So Nadia, could you answer that question, please? Yes, of course, Leo, thank you. And thank you for the question. We do acknowledge that it's very difficult to assess or to know the level of implementation of these policies in countries. And that is why we said that this is a general review at a very high level. But the data that we gathered for our policy mapping could be analyzed in greater detail to evaluate status and progress, and also facilitators and barriers in terms of implementing these recommendations. I understand that there are some studies that are using the data from this review. PAHO, for example, is working in some countries so as to gather information regarding facilitating elements and barriers. Another important thing is, as the comment says, it's important to have a baseline and to know regarding sodium in food, for example, how is that being measured? How is it being measured before we implement these measures? I think that the result of the IDRC study mentioned by Adriana and Lorena is very important because that gives us a baseline for the countries. And also we have monitoring data for 19 countries. So all of this work together, all of these efforts, I think can pay off in the long run. Thank you very much, Nadia. And now I wanted to ask another question. I have another question that was uh, included at the very beginning, which is uh, what is the highest level that salt that can have in processed foods? This is an interesting uh, question and uh, difficult to answer because it will depend on the category of our products. Most of the countries have identified what uh, the largest uh, sources of sodium are in their daily food. And uh, they've set uh, their objectives on the basis of that. And Pajo already has a set of objectives uh, that have been defined uh, for some foodstuffs or categories of products. And I believe that later on, some work is being done in order to expand this. So it has to do with the context, uh, but definitely the regional assistance that, that can be provided is very important. Thank you very much. And uh, to add to this, as PAHO, we have set the regional goals for salt reduction, and it is based on the category of food because some foodstuffs by nature contain more salt than others. So bread, for example, or cold cuts, cold meats, others. And we've set goals per type of product and they're currently being updated. So soon we will have in another webinar where we will report on these new goals, these new regional goals, and we've also been asked uh, whether these uh, goals 
ought to be mandatory or voluntary. As a Bajo, it is definitely up to countries to make that decision. But from what we know, evidence-based and what has happened is that mandatory goals have proven to be more effective in many cases. And companies even prefer that because then we have everyone at the same level that if a company lowers at the level of salt and the competition doesn't do that, then it's not advisable. So it is good to have some clear regulations in connection with that. And let me continue with you, Nadia. We have another question for you, whether the front the labeling, the warning could uh, contribute to, to these policies and solve the consumption reduction and if, uh, that uh, could be a social marketing strategy. Oh, excellent question. Well, yes, we have uh, seen and evidence uh, shows that friend labeling uh, with the nutritional warnings provides a simple information and uh, in very simple words, uh, lets uh, the consumer know what the product contains. And so this is also within uh, the four most uh, effective recommendations uh, dictated by WHO. So my answer would be yes. And what was uh, the last part of the question? Well, whether or how this is a related as a supplement to social marketing strategies, if it both uh, can be linked. Well, yes, it is important. And this is something that we're seeing in our experience and not only in applying and implementing the strategy, but also to communicate to the population how to use uh, this front labeling. So it goes hand in hand with this. And it is there where social marketing comes in because it can help us uh, communicate effectively what uh, the objectives are with these uh, policies and to identify the target audience in each uh, circumstance. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so front labeling does uh, have uh, as an advantage that it informs a consumer. So it can be used as a supplement to social marketing. And so this is simple information on what the uh, foodstuffs contain high levels of sodium and it can also help in the reformulation of uh, food because undoubtedly many of you are well acquainted with the experience in chile that they have the octagons of uh, food that, that have a high content in fat and sugar and salt so in order to avoid having a seal or a stamp on the product showing that it is has a high content in fat, salt, or sugar. Many producers have reformulated their products. And so they've done some research in Chile looking into that and it's proven to be quite effective. Another question that is asked is whether there are any forms of salt that are healthier, such as a Himalayan salt. In fact, all salts are the same. It is a sodium chloride and it is a 40% of sodium and 60% of chloride. So there is nothing else. You cannot compare it. One artisanal salt is not healthier than another one or a special salt or the Himalayan salt. Yes, you pay more for it, but it doesn't have or bring any benefit to health. Another question has to do with uh, the recommendation for salt. Uh, this is another one that we have on the chat. Well, we have WHO guidelines and the recommendation is two milligrams of sodium per 2,000 kilocalories or five per kilocalorie. And since they consume less uh, salt uh, in children, the recommendation is lower. They've also asked um, about uh, salt and iodine uh, programs are compatible. And if they are, then experts uh, have gotten together. That is to say, iodine and salt experts uh, got together and currently iodine consumption is adequate in the region. 
There's also a lot of uh, cubes, uh, bouillon cubes uh, that are being fortified. So with uh, iodine reduction programs and salt uh, programs, there is no danger for iodine. Now there's another question and I will uh, transfer these uh, the question to Mahmouda. And this has to do with the following, whether we have any marketing campaigns, social marketing campaigns uh, and uh, whether salt reduction campaigns show that the benefits of fluoride and iodine can be included in the campaign itself. I will just have to say, um, I don't really have the information related to that um, about the fluoride. And uh, sorry, uh, I can't hear you. No. Sorry, Mahmouda, we can't hear you. We lost the sound. Um, Okay. Uh, I can okay. answer that question, Leo, says Adriana. I believe that we can do that because precisely what we need is to find the right dose of iodine and a fluoride for a given consumption of salt and for people to also consume these certain amounts. So trying to strike a balance, we cannot have, for example, that the current situation, as far as I understand, in some Central American countries, where the recommendation or the level that has been established for iodine and fluoride is for a consumption of 10 grams of salt, that the dose has to be adjusted for a dose of five grams or less. So we have to go the extra mile there and to see how we deal with both things. And also in a campaign that we have to re-educate people because it is not a matter of eliminating salt. We know that this is an essential nutrient and that we also need it for flavor together with the condiments and the seasonings that we have in a natural way. But I believe that we have to work together. It can't be that one is against the other one. None of the two programs, uh, we have to work together with both because both are public health problems with our population. Now, thank you. Thank you, I agree. And I believe that if uh, both are programs, well, rather they're not only compatible, both programs, but we can also have messages, joint messages because by promoting iodine, we don't uh, want to send out the, the message that salt is good, but at the same time, we do want to say that you have to reduce the level of salt, but that the salt that you eat is iodized salt. So in the, that, that regard, it is important. And we have some other questions that have to do with uh, the products or that the salt with a lower content of sodium. And it seems to me that maybe Lorena can shed some light on this. It seems to me that Lorena, you've seen the questions, the relevant questions in the chat. Yes, thank you, Leo. And thank you for these questions. Regarding salts, Himalaya salt, as Leo already said, the different uh, types of salt, they come from different sources. They go through a different treatment, but they're not significantly lower in sodium. More than 90% of the minerals are sodium and only a very low percentage of iron, iodine, fluoride, etc. But there are salt substitutes for table salt that we have potassium chloride or magnesium chloride that have been used in some studies. And it's been shown that that does help lower salt consumption and actually increases magnesium consumption that helps cardiovascular health. But often we do not consume it in large amounts. In Peru, we had an experience where a salt substitute is sodium potassium chloride was used. And although this did not lower sodium consumption, there was an increase in potassium consumption. And in the long term, that prevented uh, uh, high blood pressure 
and helped prevent high blood pressure. Now, these salts are quite acceptable. However, the flavor is slightly different. It can be used along with common salt, and that helps offset the metallic flavor. And they are not uh, used by most of the population, except when there is renal disease, where it is important to control their uh, blood pressure. But uh, in that case, it could be used as an alternative to reduce salt consumption. I think that now Dr. Mamuda is able to speak. So Dr. Mamuda, we can incorporate messages on benefits of iodine and fluor in campaigns on salt reduction. And there's another question for you as well. Uh, it's a question about how we can uh, uh, make use or consider tradi traditions and family ties uh, established in association with uh, food and the perceptions of each family about it and what strategies uh, we can use uh, to have a good intervention in sodium reduction in families, uh, considering those perceptions and, and uh, uh, behaviors. Okay, so for you can hear me now, right? Yes, yes. Um, so the first question related to iodine, one of the things that was a that was a concern that came up quite often when we did the formative research, um, the confusion of messages um, related to iodine and then if we're coming in with the salt. So one of the recommendations that we had, um, and it's not only just with the iodine, if you're working on say sugar or other, is a coordination of efforts. Because when you look at some of the key insights that we brought up related to tradition, related to taste, um, the quantification, those are common concerns that exist for many other areas that we work in within public health. So one of the recommendations that we had is the coordination with other um, experts or other leaders so that when you're developing the messages that you're coordinating it so you're not like just talking about one solely but trying to put it within a bucket of a lot of other points. So that's to kind of address the first question um, that was mentioned as it relates to iodine, just saying more coordination of efforts amongst the audiences. The second part of the question in terms of how you go about bringing the tradition component into the family. Um, one of the issues that we brought up, um, and this is more so within the concept of um, the Caribbean countries when we were working there, is some of the strategies that we came up with is um, actually having um, some doing some level of competition or um, on like social media so that mothers and families could contribute family related traditional recipes, but doing adaptations of it with um, other ingredients as a way to then still carry the tradition forward, but then it's like sharing peer to peer as a way to then, um, you know, uh, work on this issue of salt reduction. So it was a tactic or a strategy, but it was very much applicable at a particular country level. So broadly, I can say for your um, question is um, for the related to traditions as it pertains to family. One is that I would encourage anyone who's working on this to go and do a little bit more listening or research to really understand what exactly is the tradition and also how are they using salt. So similar to what Peru did in their example. And then once you have a little bit of a better understanding of that, then use that as a way to then develop the strategies that you will be doing in country. Um, so much of this may be very localized. It may be not very high level in terms of population level. It may have to go down to a very specific or local level. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have here a question of Patricia Thompson, which is in English. Uh, so, um, she is wondering uh, to implement these programs of the long term, term if that will require a lot of resources, especially human resources. Uh, what types of professionals do you use to reach all the market segments in Latin America versus Caribbean and uh, give you an idea of the ratio of nutritionists to population size in the countries you you work with. Uh, yeah, maybe for the Caribbean, there are less nutritionists than, than for Latin American countries. Uh, we have the, the shake packets of uh, developed by Dobeso, which is especially developed for uh, low and middle income countries. Uh, 
I, I believe that some salt reduction um, programs are relatively easy to, to implement. Uh, it's important that there's a, a, a political will and that there's advocacy. Uh, and maybe uh, not all components can be implemented and uh, probably surveillance is the most complex one, but uh, things like uh, remove salt shakers uh, in restaurants or set norms uh, for uh, uh, food uh, in schools, uh, also working with industry, the, like uh, the, the food targets uh, we are going to present soon. Uh, these are feasible for industries to, to implement. So um, uh, I, I think, I hope uh, with that, this question is, uh, is answered. Uh, there are a few more, more questions. Uh, uh, there's a question about the uh, gold standard. Uh, this probably refers to the 24 hour uh, urine uh, collection to measure iodine consumption, uh, which is, of course, the, the best we can do. Uh, but we have also a, a protocol uh, to, um, uh, to measure salt uh, based on spot urine, uh, which can be incorporated in the uh, in the step surface. Uh, entonces, uh, que más? Um, what else do we have? Should there be discounts for healthy foods? Yes, to promote a low salt diet it is important to promote healthy eating and there are a lot of policies that we have to discourage major consumption of ultra processed foods there's another question on temperature we know that uh, Salt is excreted through the sweat, but your body adapts, so you lose less salt. So just uh, because you think you may sweat, you don't need to consume more salt. Marine salt, other alternatives, they're usually not iodized, that's true. However, there are a lot of fortified foods. And so in the region, there is enough iodine consumption. Okay, I think that we are coming to the end of this webinar. It's 1230. So I would give the panelists the chance to say some final words. I begin with Mamuda. Um, well, thank you. Uh, I, I, I just want to say thank you for organizing this webinar. And um, it was very nice to kind of skip the big picture from policy level to behavior change and then also see the implementation um, at the level of the, um, the various countries. Um, but I really enjoyed it and hearing all of it and then also um, he, um, getting all the different questions that um, the participants have been sharing. Um, so it's been a really good experience kind of getting a big overview of the issue as it pertains itself to the region. Thank you very much. Uh, Nadia. Thank you, Leo. Thank you all for your attention. This was an excellent webinar. And we always learn from the work being done in the region. So it was great to hear from Adriana, from Nadia. I just wanted to say that we have made progress in policy in countries of the region, but undeniably there is still a lot of work to be done. In the countries, greater support is required. Something I saw in my review is that when country teams are put together in a country that bring in academia, public and private sector, this type of measurement, monitoring, for example, 
implementing strategies, all of that becomes much more sustainable. So that would be my final comment. But once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Lorena? I too would like to thank you for your invitation. It's important that we are able to reach as many people as possible using this medium. This is an important juncture for the region. Right now, Latin America is promoting frontal labeling, and that is a trend that we can make good use of. We can continue to join together in our efforts, and as Nadia was saying, we can work with civil society. They can accomplish major things. We've seen that with front of package labeling, not only working with academia, but also with civil society and the government. And in this way, we can coordinate our efforts, surveillance, monitoring, as Manuel was saying, it's important that we do that. That makes us feel reassured in terms of our implementation. And for that, we need monitoring. Thank you. And then last, uh, lastly, we will hear from Adriana. Thank you. Well, first of all, it's obvious that the more research we do, the more we find, and that increases the doubts we have. So we do have information, but we have new areas for work. So the more you dig, the more you want to explore. So we begin by looking at the different dishes in the countries. We only analyze 20. Just imagine out of all of the dishes, all of the food products and countries. And someone was asking me, how can we sample the food sold on streets by each and every vendor? So I think that here we have to work with municipalities. I saw that the question was in English, but my English is not good, so I didn't answer in English. But sometimes you have to work with mayor's offices, think of food safety and nutritional uh, information too. I found that 30 or 40 percent of energy consumption in some groups of the population comes from this type of food. And of course, some of us may eat some of these foods occasionally, but it's the poor population that consume the most. Now, do they know about preventing cardiovascular disease? What type of medication do they take? So we have to work with this group of foods to learn more about it. Thank you. I wanted to thank all of our panelists. Thank you for your excellent presentations and There is very, very fertile ground to move ahead in public health. We have our most cost-effective interventions. So we hope that everyone will pursue their efforts and we here in PAHO will continue to support you. We hope that you will also connect for future webinars and Now we're going to say, uh, I hope you enjoy seeing the same video, but this time it will be in English. Enjoy your day. Join me to make this delicious and healthy to make. Join me to make this delicious and healthy tomato sauce with more flavor and less salt. With this sauce, you can reduce your salt intake, which usually contributes to health problems such as high blood pressure and cardiovascular diseases. The ingredients you're going to need are accessible and inexpensive. These are tomatoes, onion, garlic, paprika or smoked paprika, laurel, pepper, cinnamon, and lemon. Remember, just before you start cooking, you have to wash your hands. Now, place the tomatoes in a pot of water 
over high heat until it starts to boil. Once you see that the skin of the tomato is coming off, you can turn off the fire. Peel the tomatoes carefully. Now add them in a blender with garlic, onion, pepper, paprika or smoked paprika, and cinnamon. That will help contrast the flavors nicely. Now mix everything until it's all together. Pass the mixture through a strainer to filter the seeds. Cook the tomato mixture over medium heat for 15 to 20 minutes, along with bay leaf, until the sauce is reduced. Then add the juice of half a lemon and mix. The lemon will serve as a preservative. The sauce can be placed in a glass container. Let it cool for about 20 to 30 minutes before putting it in the fridge. And then put some chopped basil on top. This healthy tomato sauce can last you up to a week in the fridge. You can also keep it in the freezer to last longer. You can use it as a base for pasta, pizzas, and put rice, lentils, beans, and any other dish of your choice with it.